God's altar. Your heart, God's altar. See, one thing that I want to do is I want to change. How many guys here want to change? Okay. But we don't want to change into what we want to be. We don't want to change what other people want us to be. We want to change and be what God has called us to be. Amen? We don't want to change and what we want to be. We don't want to change what others want us to be. We want to change and be what God has called us to be. be. And I believe that we are created in the image of God. Somebody say, yeah. That's so funny. I just got an uh, email from uh, the label right here. Sorry. Can't reply now. Anyway. <clears throat> um, we were created to be in God's image. If you look at Genesis 1, 26 through 27, you'll see that God created Adam and Eve in what? His image. Somebody say God's image. Now, I'm not, ta- I'm not, I'm not calling you guys all gods. You are not, believe me, we are fallen. Okay? I'm not going to touch that one with a five million foot pole because it's not true. We are called to be his image. Amen? We are called to be an extension of who he is in heaven on the earth. What did Jesus pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is where? In heaven. Amen? So when Jesus left the disciples here with the Great Commission, he says, all right, guys, it's your turn to let me move through you. Heal the sick. You know, speak in, in, in tongues. Cast out demons. You guys go and do the work of the ministry. Amen? And Jesus said in, in, that, that we are all part of the body of Christ. See, um, <clears throat> Stuart is a part of this body of Christ, a member of this church. And by the way, membership, if you're interested in membership, we don't have the applications available, the, available now, but they will be at the Connect Center starting next week. We're going to be doing that in October, just so you know if you want to become a member. But anyway, um, so, you know, so he is a piece of this body here in, in the church. <clears throat> what he does is a lot different than what Bob Eaton does, who's on vacation and can be with us this Sunday. He's really excited about it. Amen? Bob Eaton. But they're all pieces of the body. We are all, and we are all called to be a part of our local body right here, Church on the Rock. But how many guys know that Church on the Rock is a part of a bigger body right here in the city? We've got Pastor Adonon uh, preaching over at Gospel. What is it called? A night of full gospel. We've got another uh, anointed guy there uh, uh, preaching. There, uh, uh, Pastor Dan King, Assemblies of God. You know, who, uh, Pastor, um, I'm having trouble remembering all their names right now, but Stu, Stuart, over at the Presbyterian Church. I mean, this, church, this city is full of churches, and we're all called to do our part here in the city. I can't do, we can't do, we are not called to do some of the things that the Presbyterian Church is called to do because they're called to do it. We do something different. And that doesn't mean we're any better than them or they're any better than us. That just means that we're a part of the body. Amen? You may think, well, you know what? The head is really important. If I don't have a head, I probably can't do anything. Probably true. Now, the toe, probably, you know, who needs the toe? How many guys know if you don't have a toe, you can't can't even walk hardly? It's just as important. We're all important to the body of Christ. And we are called to be a part of the body of Christ. Amen? Somebody say, yeah. Okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so let's talk about some things that I think, based on the Word, make us be an image of God. How many of you guys know the fruit of the Spirit is important in being a part of God's image? Amen? Galatians 5, through 23, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are all the fruit of being with Christ. How many of you guys know patience is important? And when you're being patient with somebody, you are being an extension of the patience that God has with us. How many of you guys have, have, have seen that God is patient with you? Seriously. How many of you guys have seen that God is loving and kind to you. And we say to one another, how can we love somebody who seems to be unlovable? How can we be patient with somebody who seems to be impatient the same way that Jesus was lovable to you when you were unlovable? The same way that Jesus was patient with you when you were impatient. And that's how we love one another in the body. Somebody say, yeah. 
All right, so we're an extension. Um, I think another part is to be about our Father's business. If you're in the image of Christ, you should be doing something for Jesus. Something. Amen. Mary lost Jesus. I mean, I'd love to hear that conversation. I've said that before. Mary's with Joseph. They've left, you know, the, the city. And Mary says, oh, my gosh, Joseph, I think I just lost the Son of God. We left him behind, you know. Hey, speak, you know, he's talking to God someday when she goes to heaven. You know, God, I'm really sorry I lost your son. I mean, that's just crazy, but it's true. And when they found him, he said, Mom, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? What was Jesus doing? He was about his father's business. Can I ask you a personal question today? Oh, gosh, don't get personal with me, Pastor Jeff. I can handle the general stuff, but just the personal stuff? Have you been about your father's business this week? Are you ready to be about your father's business in the week to come? Or are you too busy with your own business that you don't have time for God? Come on. We need to be about our Father's business. In Acts 10, 38, it says this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were uh, under the power of the devil because God was with him. What was Jesus doing? He was out doing good. Sometimes I look at our social media and I say, that is not good. I look at Christians and some of the things that they're saying and some of the things that they're doing. Can I ask you a personal question? How is the body of Christ supposed to rise up and be what God has called us to be if it's too busy tearing itself apart? How can we be focused on the gospel and Jesus if we're focused on tearing others apart? It just drives me, it drives me nuts. I'm like, I get so frustrated with it. I see something about, oh, well, pastor so-and-so, he's, you know, he's uh, doing this and he's um, doing that. I'm like, how do you know? You don't know pastor whatever. You haven't been in his home. You don't, you don't even know what he's doing. And you're passing judgment on this pastor. I mean, I know that there are false prophets out there. I get that. But just because I believe something different than what the Baptist church in this city believes doesn't mean that they're false teachers, for crying out loud. They're a part of the body. As my mom used to say when I was a kid, when she got really upset, you need to shut your mouth. <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We need, sometimes we need to shut our mouths. Are you passionate about this? Absolutely. Amen. We're a part of the body. And, you know, we're the hands and feet of Jesus, all right? <clears throat> but, you know, have you ever felt frustrated with yourself because you're just not changing? Are you, there are things in your life that you think, this just is not changing. Maybe it's an area of your life where there's sin. Maybe it's an area of your life where you're struggling and there's hurt. Maybe there's an area of your life that you're just not going forward and you feel like you're always going backward. I want to share with you a little secret tonight. Matthew 23, 25 through 26. Jesus says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees. First, clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and the outside may be clean. Translation. If your heart is not right before the Lord, then it doesn't matter how noble or how, how good things look on the outside, it's still not what God wants from you. God wants more. He wants your heart. In Matthew, 8, or Matthew 15, 8 through 9, it says this. Jesus said, people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and in vain they worship me. Do you hear that? He says, what they're doing looks good, but their hearts aren't right. Amen? Dan, I may need to use your guitar. Thanks. And a clean channel or whatever. Um, our hearts have to be right. Jesus is saying stuff going on in your life will change when your heart changes. Now, I got to be honest. I went to um, Kirk Cameron's. Thank you. I got that song. The first fighting for. But anyway, and it, it was really good. And he shared this. And, was, and, and then he was sharing this. I thought, this reminds me of something that happened just a few weeks ago. So I'm going to combine what really happened and Kirk's example of dogs, okay? 
Now, you guys know that, that my dog, Hershey, you've probably seen pictures of him online. He was a whopping 110 pounds. The doctor said he's got to lose weight. We think the dog has gluten allergies. Hello. Um, <laughs> it breaks out and stuff. We're trying to get, to get him healthier. We bought him another little dog called Mocha to exercise him. And he did. He lost about 10 pounds. And with no more food from the table, I'd be like slipping pizza to him underneath the table. You know, I'm like, all right, Hershey, I got you back, man. You know? And then he'd break out. And he's like, somebody's giving him gluten. I'm like, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, but he wasn't losing weight fast enough. So one night... Um, I came home a little late from Double Edge, and everybody's in bed, the house is quiet, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to come in really quiet, I don't want to wake the kids up, they usually have like a movie night in the living room, and they lay out on the floor and watch movies till late, I'm not going to, I don't want to interrupt them and all, I walk in, the house is dark, the downstairs is empty, everybody's in their rooms, I thought, you know, I'm just going to enjoy some peace, and the older I get, I love peace, so I quietly went into the living room, I sat down on the couch and enjoyed the sound silence and suddenly heard the sound of a plate crashing to the ground in the kitchen <laughs> I'm like what's going on in there so I, I, I walk in the dining room really quiet I look up and Hershey like a big bear is up on top of the stove like this and he is not taking the time to eat he just takes his paw and goes <clears throat> and knocked all the pizza and all the crap off the thing, broke all the plates, and was so busy eating it, he didn't hear me come up from behind him. <laughs> you know, so I could do some stuff to stop Hershey from doing that. I could tie him up, but you know what he's going to do? He's going to bite through the collar. He's hungry. It's in his nature to love food that's not good for him, like me, you know? And I could put him in a cage. He's going to get out of the cage. He know, he's, a, he's a very smart lab. He'll find a way to get to that. And how many guys know that there are things that God doesn't want us to have or do because they hurt us called sin, and we could put up restraints so that we don't do that sin, but ultimately can't stop us from biting through and getting what we want when we think that nobody's looking Amen? The only way, and I think that this is impossible for a dog, but possible for us, to change Hersey's nature to cha is to change his heart. Somehow convince him that meat's not good for him, and his heart completely changed toward that. You know, Jesus did that for us. See, it's not what you're doing that's causing the problems. It's the heart you're doing it with. And a great prayer would be, Lord, help me not do this. Or, Lord, I'm sorry when I do this. Or, Lord, I want to abstain from doing this. Or putting things in place so that you can't get to that thing that's not good. But ultimately, you could get there. The only thing that's going to change it is keeping your heart on the altar. Because when we put our hearts on the altar, we allow God to change our hearts. And it has to be there all the time. As soon as we take our hearts off the altar, that's when bad things begin to happen. But when we keep our hearts on the altar, that's where God can keep us changed. That's where God can transform us. Because how many know, what is an altar? An altar is where they would give offerings. God wants us to give our lives as offerings. Amen? Somebody say, yeah. yeah. All right? So we need to do that. Now, there's a guy named David in the Bible, King David. Somebody say, King David. And King David was a man known after God's own heart, right? Throughout history, that's what they said. David, the man after God's own heart. But King David, David, King Deva, that's funny. Deva is running cameras, and that is the feminine from the Hebrew David is Deva, so hi Deva, didn't mean to put you in there, but anyway, but the problem that David has was he had a woman problem. He liked women, lots of them, and he wanted to, to have lots of women, and, and that's not good. Somebody said that's not good. You know, he, he enjoyed being paid attention to by women. He loved being in the presence of many women. He had, it's a long story and it's not right, but this dude had concubines, and we don't look it up, Google it. I'm not going there. But, you know, women that he was with regularly, all the time. But there was this one woman, her name was Bathsheba, and she's out on the roof bathing, and David sees her, right? And what does he, he do? He sees her, and he wants to order from the menu. 
He wants, he wants this woman. He finds out she's, she's married, and you know what? He still is intimate with her, and he gets her pregnant. So instead of coming before the God with his heart, he dismisses it and pretends there's nothing going on. Does that sound familiar? He pretends there's no problem. There's nothing going on here. We're good, right? And then what he does is he's like, okay, I'm going to set this up so that her husband comes back from the war and is with her, and then they'll think that that's how she got pregnant. But there was a, a law back then that made it unclean for somebody who was fighting a war to come out of that and be with his wife. And so this dude is a noble dude, and he refuses to be with his wife. So David doesn't come clean again. He pretends there's nothing going on. And then what he does is he takes the guy and he sends him out to war on the front lines to be killed and murdered. And David again pretends that nothing is happening, pretends that everything is good, doesn't give his heart out to God about what's going on until the prophet Nathan shows up and says, you know what? You stole somebody out to sheep, which is translation, you took something that wasn't yours. And it's wrong. And then you killed this person. David gets it. And he writes a, a powerful psalm. It's in Psalm 51, verse 10. And, it, and, and David says this. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, when, we're not, uh, when our hearts are not on the altar, our spirits are not right. We're bitter. We're frustrated. We're angry. Everybody else is the problem. When in reality, the problem is we took our hearts off the altar. So what does David do? David repents. And because of that repentance, he is known as a man that had an adulterous affair with, his, with another woman. But he's also known as a man who has a heart for God. The Bible says, don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Mind. mind. In, in some translations of mind could actually be translated heart. You know? And you know what's even harder about this? Is that like, like we're, we could be self-deceived. For the longest, not the longest time, but for quite a while, a while, I was deceived to think I could dance. I cannot dance. I was in high school. You know, I, I went to like two dances, and, and, and I left the first one like, whatever, because this is crazy, I'm too shy, this is nerve-wracking. Last one, some cheerleader invited me to a dance, and I went and was naturally horrified there. And my best friend tried to teach me how to dance. And he goes, show me what you got. I'm like, all right. <laughs> He's like, dude, stop waving your hands around. He goes, you put your hands down. You act like, I can't even do it. He goes, you do this. He's doing all these sides. I can't dance. You know, so we get to this dance, and, and um, this friend who's the cheerleader says, all right, let's dance. And then her and the basketball team and some of my friends get around us all, and I'm supposed to dance. So you know what I did? <laughs> it's like the room cleared. Like, stay away from that, dude. You know? I was deceived into thinking I could dance when I couldn't dance, and being self-deceived is not good. I caused a lot of problems in that room, I think, you know? It, we, sometimes as Christians, we're self-deceived, and that's a scary thing. The Bible says that we don't even know our own hearts. So how can we judge somebody else's heart or even judge our own hearts if we don't even know our own hearts? The Bible says in Jeremiah 17 that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. So the reason you need to take your heart and put it on the altar is because you don't even know in your heart where you're really at. Only Jesus does. Amen? Somebody say, yeah. yeah. So if you want to continue to grow and change, yes, what you're doing, if it's wrong, repent. And yeah, offer prayers to help you to grow. But the most important prayer is this. Create in me a clean heart. Lord, change my heart. I had a, a, this one person um, two years ago just got on my nerves Everything they did just drove me bonkers. And I, would, I wouldn't outwardly say or do anything, but in my heart, I was like, Ugh. you ever get that with somebody? Like, oh, you know? 
and, and I was secretly thinking things about, man, I just wish they would stop doing that. And oh my gosh, that's so annoying. And then they would come and want to have conversations with me. And, and I was feeling bitter and resentful. And it really started to, to bother me. And I said, Lord, what is going on? And, and I felt the Lord say, I need to change your heart. And so I, that's what I said. I said, God, change my heart. I, I'm not in control of how they act, what they do, or what anybody does. The only thing I'm in control of, and barely that, is me through you. And you know what started to happen? The first time I had a conversation with them after I prayed that prayer, and they were talking to me, I didn't outwardly do it, but I started to feel like crying. I started to feel tears coming. And I started to see the weight, the pain, and the struggle they were struggling with. And started to realize that instead of taking that weight off of them by encouraging them, that many times I was adding weight to them by not having a good attitude when I was with them. God changed my heart. And that ended up being a great relationship. Because he changed my heart. I was repenting for the things I was thinking. I was repenting for how I was acting. And that's important. But what God said is, listen, if you really want to change, you got to go to the source, your heart. That's where the change happens. See, the change here that we want to see in our church and the change that we want to see in our community comes from the change that God wants to see in our own hearts. You hear that? And so... I want to encourage you today, and I'm going to sing a, a quick song. I want to encourage you today to keep your heart on the altar. I challenge you, I dare you, to start praying that prayer this week. Create in me a clean heart. The Lord will show you how to repent. He'll show you things that need to change, but ultimately you'll be able to do it because God is your source. Tap A.